The Wapiti are a tribe of Native Americans who once roamed the Heartlands region of New Hanover. Through years of conflict, they faced American settlers and the United States government, which significantly weakened their society. Signing treaty after treaty with the US government, however they'd all eventually be broken. And by the events of Red Dead Redemption 2, they roamed the Heartlands no longer, being relocated to a reservation in Amberino. However, this isn't the end of the struggles for these people. And so, in today's video, we're going to be exploring the plight of the Wapiti. The first time we come across the Wapiti Native Americans in Red Dead Redemption 2 is right at the end of Chapter 1 in the mission Eastward Bound. Trouble, we wouldn't have seen him. Poor bastards. We really screwed them over down here. Come on, let's not push our luck. What happened? Well, get in. I'll tell you. Three riders watch the Vandalin gang's caravan from afar. Charles assures Arthur and Hosea that if they wanted trouble, they would not have shown themselves. As the three continued their journey, Hosea tries to explain what happened to these poor people, and how they were really screwed over down here. So, yes, the Indians in these parts got sold a very raw deal. This is the heartlands we're going to. Good farming and grazing country, they lost it all. Stolen clean away from them it was, every blade of grass. Killed or herded up to the reservations in the middle of nowhere. And how's that different from anywhere else? Well, maybe it's not. I just heard some of the army out here was particularly uh, unpleasant about it. Unpleasant? How do you rob and kill people pleasantly? We don't, in spite of Dutch's talk. So what we learn is, the Heartland's Native American population lost their land, stolen from them by the US government, and then they were either killed or herded up to reservations in the middle of nowhere. Charles explains that that's not really too different from anywhere else, but apparently the army in this region specifically were particularly unpleasant about it. A poor explanation and deliberately so for the narrative purposes, but that unpleasantry is far from done. The Vanderlyn gang finds themselves at Horseshoe Overlook, which is nearby to the livestock town of Valentine. By piecing together tiny tidbits of information, we can come to discover that the people of Valentine believe their town to be cursed, and the source of this curse appears to be the massacre of Native American people who were settled on the land where Valentine now stands. And in the game files, you can find an ancient painting depicting this massacre. It's unclear if this is the same people as the Wapiti, but the Heartlands was once their home, and connecting the dots it would make sense. Anyway, if that is the case, this shows the beginning of those unpleasantries between the Wapiti people and the settlers expanding west. Regardless, historical adversity clearly wasn't the end of it. Despite being moved up to the reservation, it would appear as if the natives of this region still have some enemies. During a hunting trip with Charles Smith, which can be available in both Chapter 2 and Chapter 3, Arthur and Charles stumble across the senseless killing of many bison, leaving their bodies to rot. Upon tracking down the poachers responsible, this is the explanation they gave for their strange actions. Why are you killing those bison and leaving them to rot? I don't know what you're talking about! God damn it, tell us you're dead! They make it look like it was Indians. Just kill him, Arthur. No, please, don't kill me. I'm begging you. I've heard enough. Somebody paid the poachers to kill as many bison as possible, leaving their bodies to rot and making it look like it was the work of Native Americans. Why? My best guess is to sow the seeds of unrest and push a narrative that shines a negative light on Native American communities to further somebody's agenda somewhere. Naturally, we will get to the bottom of this, but for the time being, let's move on. The predicament of the Wapiti only really becomes known to us outright in Chapter 4, 
During the mission The Gilded Cage, the mayor of Saint-Denis hosts a private party to which Dutch Vanderlind manages to procure an invite courtesy of Angelo Bronte. Whilst he's snobbishly pointing people out in the crowd and mocking them, he points out a couple of Native Americans. Oh, the Redskins. <laughs> I have no sympathy for them, because whoever is stupid enough to get tricked by the Americans, no? <laughs> they get what they deserve, huh? <laughs> yes, and the letter to the mayor. Oh yeah, that'll save you. <laughs> After this, while in the city of Saint-Denis, Arthur Morgan will meet these individuals who are seeking aid for their people and struggling to do so, it would appear. Well, I'm sorry. Have you met? This is Rain's Fall, a great chief, and his son, Eagle Flies. Gentlemen, yeah, we saw you in the wagon train crossing the river at Cumberland Falls, and at the party you were upstairs. You have great powers of observation. Yes, my people, if we are even a people anymore. We've fought hard. We've made peace treaties, and those treaties were broken, and we've been moved and punished and punished and moved. I'm sure. And now I am told we are to be moved again. Clearly contravening the peace treaty signed three years ago. This will lead to war. No, my son, it will not. We cannot fight another war. They have got stronger. And we have become far weaker, Mr. Morgan. Well, it's a bad business. It's to do with oil. I know it is, but I need the proof. I believe there were some prospectors who were on their land a few months ago who have filed reports with Leviticus Cornwall and the state government claiming huge reserves of oil under their land. So... You want me to try and steal it? Despite treaties in the past being broken, the Wapiti people, who had now moved to a reservation courtesy of the government, now risk losing their home once again because of oil, allegedly. This leads Chief Rain's fall and his son Eagle Flies to approach Arthur Morgan for assistance, the job being to infiltrate Cornwall kerosene and tar to find information that proves that Cornwall and the US government are conspiring to displace the Wapiti natives once again so they can drill for oil on the land they moved them to in the first place. Quieten yourself, friend. This won't take long. Danbury. Yes? I need some papers, my friend. Nothing important. A file. I'm from head office. You're not from head office. Does that seem important right now? No. I need a file by the Leland Oil Development Company. The one about the oil near Wapiti. I... Danbury. Think, man. A mind is a terrible thing to lose. Especially over such a nice I... floor as this. It's here! It's here! You done good, Danbury. Real good. They'll give you a promotion for this. Unfortunately though, the clandestine approach to acquiring this information does go a little bit awry. <sighs> Weapons on the ground and hands in the air. Easy now, fellas. Now, we won't tell you again. Time's up! Fortunately, Eagle Flies creates a distraction so Arthur Morgan can escape and return his findings to him. That explosion came just in time. I was happy to watch some of that oil burn. So you met Mr. Danbury? Yes, don't worry. He was very obliging. I thought you wasn't getting involved. I thought you were going to enter and leave silently. Thank you. You saved my life. Thank you. I hope. Well, I don't know what I hope. But who knows? Maybe these will be of some use. Here's your money. Thank you. While this letter can't be read and we don't know quite what was detailed on it, while robbing Cornwall's train in chapter 1 we can come across a letter from the Leyland Oil Development Company. 
which reads as follows. Dear Mr. Cornwall, we are yet to receive payment of $2,000 for the initial phase of exploration at the Wapiti Indian Reservation Amberino, as agreed in the contract between Cornwall Kerosene and Tar and the Leyland Oil Development Company dated November 9th, 1898. On receipt of the funds, we will proceed with phases two and three of the project and present you with a detailed report of the findings within the month. Yours respectfully, James Critchley, Head of Accounts, Leyland Oil Development Company. So an investigation into the prospect of oil at the Wapiti Reserve certainly did take place, and Cornwall certainly is involved. This isn't the last we hear of the struggles of the Wapiti, however, as their problems come much farther to the forefront of the main story of the game in Chapter 6. I brought a friend, Arthur. Hello. Hello. Dutch. This is Eagle Flies. His father is a great chief. Charles and I, we... Uh... Pretended to be mercenaries. Did me a great favor. Dutch Vanderlyn. How do you do? Not well, sir. Well, I am sorry to hear that. How's your father? Father is confused. Wisdom with weakness. His people, my people. We've suffered too much. Been lied to too much. Now they've taken our horses. Who? The infantry division posted at Fort Wallace. Why? Colonel Favors is a liar and a murderer. His people won't stop until we're all dead. Without horses, we cannot hunt. Without hunting, we will starve. This is another act of war. I see that. You men have helped me before, and I have money. Put your money away, son. What do you think, Charles? You know I told your father I will not fight over some horses. But I made no such promise. Come along. Yeah, Arthur, we must go with them to try to stop things from getting out of hand, I guess. It would appear as if the Wapiti people also have an enemy in the United States Army. Eagle Flies tells us that the tribe's horses have been confiscated, and this military action against the Wapiti is being led by a man named Colonel Favors. However, the Native American's problems may have just gotten worse as Eagle Flies has unwittingly approached Dutch Vandalin for assistance, and while Dutch may indeed assist, He's far more interested in creating a distraction in order for him to escape the onslaught of the Pinkertons. Like I said, we just need that noise and one more score. It also appears as if there is conflict amongst the Wapiti people. He sees the clandestine aggression against his people as an attempt to provoke him. Whereas Eagle Flies, being young and proud and stubborn, wants to fight back, seeing the confiscation of the horses as an act of war. Anyways, Eagle Flies, Pater, and the members of the Vanderlyn gang successfully repossess the horses. Will one of you help me return the horses to my men? Well, Arthur Oh, Arthur needs to rest. I will. I like you, son. And after the horses, are we going to wait for the army to come and wreak its revenge? I hope not. Of course we ain't. Now let's go check out that fort of theirs. Is this a good idea? This is the only idea. And it is one that will suit both of our purposes. Fighting the army ain't wise. Stop worrying. This is exactly the distraction that we need. Your father said that fighting was an impossible gamble. There's no winning for you in this. Your father need not know anything. He'd rather live in ignorance. Come along, gentlemen. Your father would rather you did not do anything so foolish. I said I would stop this from happening. Would you talk to him? Be grateful. Yes. Would you? Sure. Oh. I'll speak with him. With Dutch now involved, this volatile situation, the scope of which has not been realized yet, can only get worse. Anyway, Arthur goes to speak with Rainsfall at the request of Charles Smith. <coughs> You don't sound very well. I'm not. I'm... I think I'm dying. And I hope you find peace. I don't know too much about peace. Apparently not. Did you have fun with my son, the impetuous prince? I believe you went on a raid with him. I'm, I'm sorry. I suppose I lack the grandeur of a conventional king. 
Uh, I don't know too many kings. Colonel Favors. He has already exacted some measure of revenge for the raid. Two women were assaulted by his men. Um, I'm very sorry about all of this. Yes. Sometimes the correct path, the bravest path, is the least obvious and also the gentlest. I'm... I'm a great disappointment to my son. Your son seems to want a war. My son thinks there is glory in death. Maybe he's right, but for me, I saw death being handed out so freely by the most foolish of men, I never could equate it with victory. Glory has come in service. Maybe. Maybe not, I don't know. I've killed a lot of people. For a whole lot of dumb reasons, I ain't never seen much glory in it. Well, your friend, Mr. Vanderlyn, he talks a lot. I don't know him, but my son is easily lit. I'm not sure I get you. Uh, well, perhaps we could go for a ride. I'm an old man. My whole life I have tried to bring peace. Rain's fall immediately makes us aware of the consequences for Eagle Fly's raid to recover the horses, as two of the tribe's women were assaulted by Colonel Favor's men. It's clear that Rain's fall's position is peace is the only option here. We're also introduced to Captain Monroe here, who arrives with bad news from Saint Denis. As I mentioned, I did speak again with the mayor and the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Saint Denis at length, but regrettably, it appears the oil company has already received approval to move forward with drilling on the reservation's land. I suppose there's much. So what does that mean for us now? I'm not sure just yet. I didn't get the impression anything would be happening for a few months. I'm very sorry, sir. I did everything I could. I know, Captain. Drilling for oil on the reservation has been approved, and while this wouldn't necessarily mean immediate action, the Native Americans living on the Wapiti reservation will have to move. Captain Monroe asks us to help him in assisting the tribe, in carrying out actions he'd rather members of the tribe not get involved in, and then departs, leaving Arthur Morgan and Rain's Fall to enjoy a rather scenic ride. Things that bad on a reservation? Yes. This conflict with Colonel Favors and his regiment at Fort Wallace continues to worsen. Many of the elders are sick, and the young feel that any compromise is an admittance of defeat. Well, we ain't done much to calm the situation. But I have to continue to seek to resolve matters through peaceful negotiation. War would be futile. Your people are lucky to have you. I'm not so sure about that. And that feller, Monroe, how you know him? Careful! Captain Monroe was reassigned here from a regiment in the north. Apparently, the news of our conflict has spread all the way to Washington. He's a good man. He wants to help. Well, I guess that's something, at least. The army aren't all bad men. Just as my people aren't all good. But this Colonel Favors, he walks an old line. He's obstinate and he hates Monroe. I just hope between us we can work this out. We learn a lot here. The elders of the Wapiti tribe are sick and dying, and the young are losing their patience with the diplomatic approach. Meanwhile, Colonel Favors is very clearly looking for an enemy. Rainsfall says the army aren't all bad men, just as the Wapiti aren't all good people, but Colonel Favors refuses to see the grey in this situation, and he appears to have a hatred for Captain Monroe, though this isn't elaborated on, though presumably his sympathy towards the Wapiti situation complicates matters. As the ride goes on, Rainsfall discovers that the army has destroyed an ancient spiritual site that the tribe holds dear, stealing some sacred items in the process, and if the tribe found out about this, there would certainly be war. Arthur and Rain's Fall discover a floating bottle of whiskey. This is a glitch, it's what happens when both characters interact with the bottle at the same time, and they also spot the smoke coming from an army camp not too far away, where the sacred items may possibly be. Oh, there they are. These 
brave men. Some of Colonel Favor's men. They must have been the ones who did this. Are you surprised this happened? Not at all. But... But I hope we were past this. Well, you got land they want. Land with oil. They moved us here. They've taken everything we had. I signed three treaties myself, and they've broken each one. Now they've taken the last hope. Now my people are going to want a war. So we head to the camp and we recover the stolen property. How did that fit in his pocket? What? You know what? Never mind. Here. I, uh, I got your things, I, I think. Yes. Thank you. I'm very sorry about this. Even sacred things are only things. People, the heart, matter more. Was anyone hurt? Yes. It's a bad business. I should not have let you do this for me. But perhaps it will stop a bigger massacre. With these, maybe I can calm my people. Maybe I can calm my son. I hope so. Thank you. We know now that Rain's Fall wants nothing but peace. However, the narrative isn't in their favor either. We can read an article that goes, Tensions high, fears of return to Indian war. Army in Amberino on edge, Fort Wallace requests more troops. The management of a reservation is a cumbersome business and the fact that issues occasionally arise is not the fault of the administration or congress. Money is appropriated quite liberally and honestly for the care of the Indian people. The children are taught something of hygiene, fed and clothed and given shelter. Yet still the Indians contaminate their own water and end up spreading typhoid to all and sundry. The Indian problem will not solve itself. The Crow, Shoshan, Cheyenne and Novaho, I've probably butchered all of those names, have signed treaties and have been moved to very generous reservation, taking to agricultural life and the tenets of Christianity. However, those contained at the Wapiti Indian Reservation remain warlike, spurred on by their chief and his son. Military officials stationed at nearby Fort Wallace warn that armed hostilities are a distinct possibility. These Indians, acting in conjunction and harmony with government officials, could prosper and become friends to the Americans who have tamed the lands from New York to California. Instead, exhibiting savagery, ingratitude, and surly behavior, the treacherous Indians falsely accuse mistreatment. In light of all the tensions reported in the region, Washington has sent another military delegation to try to reduce the tension. However, we know the allegations of mistreatment to be true. Rain's fall is a pacifist. And while there is tension and Eagle Fly certainly is raring to go, this article deliberately paints the Wapiti Native Americans in a bad light, cutting the tribe off from any potential public support by portraying them as the aggressors in this situation, thusly allowing Cornwall and Colonel Favors to bully and exploit these people more liberally. The army is free to provoke the Wapiti as much as they want, because in the public's mind, they aren't the aggressors. In the next mission, Honor Amongst Thieves, Arthur meets up with Monroe to assist with a problem. Captain Monroe. Of course. Chief's gone out trying to find medications. It's quite a business. Yes. I thought we were through with all of this. Well, we are, mostly. Colonel Favors seems to think the natives have broken some promise they never made, and apparently he's punishing them by withholding vaccines sent down by the federal government. Really? I was supposed to oversee the administration of vaccines. Now I hear the wagon's been diverted. Why would he do such a thing? To be honest, I truly don't know. They say he didn't have a very good war, so maybe he's trying to start another one. Is that what you think? I'm trying to find out, and he knows I'm trying to find out. He'd love to provoke me almost as much as he'd love to provoke these poor bastards. Meaning? Meaning that despite the fact that I think he's a horse's ass, he knows I think that. So we're just stuck here trying to make the best of things. This is the best of things. Children dying of diseases. 
No. This is awful. Where is this wagon? Where can we find it? I can show you. I'm supposed to be heading to a pediatric coming up through Valentine, but it's been diverted south instead. Come on, Captain Monroe. M Mr. Morgan, we must act with due caution. Oh, we shall. We surely shall. Now come! Monroe informs us that Colonel Favors is now withholding vaccines from the Wapiti people. We also learn he's egging on the hostilities, because apparently he didn't have a very good war and he doesn't want that to be his legacy. I was sent down from the north after all the news of unrest in the region, but I think my presence might be making things worse. What do you mean? I worry he's taking some of these actions more to protect himself now. He can incite more retaliation, maybe he can prove a stronger defense. Well, like destroying that shrine. Yes, and taking their horses. I mean, I don't know if he personally sanctioned any of this or not. This is the other problem. There's a culture now in his regiment. The rot has traveled down the trunk. With a culture of provoking the Wapiti within the regiment, the chances of tensions coming back down decrease. But for the time being, we must commandeer some medicine. Discreetly. This is it! The hell is it? You're good at The vaccines are in a lockbox in the back of the wagon, and once acquired, it's time to head back to the Wapiti Reservation. I got the medicine. Oh. Wonderful. That's great news, Mr. Morgan. Yeah, well, don't worry. It, uh, it didn't go too bad. Oh, I'll take your word for that. We could both swing for this. <coughs> yeah, well, I think I'm a little past caring about hanging, Monroe. Maybe. I just hope Colonel Favors thinks he was robbed by bandits and not... Oh, no, I'm still a bandit. There ain't no doubt about that. Of course. Well, I better get to work. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Bandit or not, this was a good thing. Maybe it'll get us both killed, but it had to be done. I hope so. In one of the next missions, Favored Sons, we rejoin Dutch and Eagle Flies, where they prepare an ambush for a unit of soldiers passing through the region. Dutch attempts to mask his intentions with a morality debate, however he makes no secret that he's trying to do this messily and sloppily to draw attention away from the Vandalind gang and onto what he refers to as the Indian problem. Arthur tries to deter Eagle Flies and the young members of the Wapiti tribe because he knows that Colonel Favors wants them to fight, but with Dutch's honeyed words, this falls on deaf ears. People will see these boys, they won't notice us, and they'll think we're gone. Everyone will blame everything on the Indian problem and we'll disappear up the river. But first we need to trap them in this pass. Naturally, with Dutch involved, the group bites off more than they can chew. And while they accomplished what they set out to do, the next phase didn't quite go according to plan. Instead of accepting humiliation, the soldiers fight back. And worse yet, they have reinforcements. Eagle Flies is captured whilst Dutch and Arthur manage to escape. A blatant act of violence against the US Army carried out by members of the Wapiti tribe is not likely to look good. The bed, as it were, has officially been shit. In the next mission, the fine art of conversation, Rain's Fall arrives at camp, believing he has finally made progress in brokering peace for his people as Colonel Favors has agreed to a meeting, hopefully to discuss and resolve grievances on both sides. Not fully trusting Favors, Rain's Fall requests that Charles and Arthur join him, as members of the Wapiti tribe are not allowed to carry arms, and hopefully with non-tribe members present, the chances of lies or violence will be reduced. Thank you for doing this, both of you. You have already done so much. Ain't a problem. Just hope nobody recognizes me. I've had a few run-ins with the army recently. I wish we could have done more to control the situation. Dutch should not have gotten involved. My son has a mind of his own. Too much so, in fact. I just hope Colonel Favors can be reasoned with. I am not asking for very much, but when our people are sick and hungry, and we find our medicine and supplies are being deliberately withheld, 
How can we not view that as something personal? When they destroy our sacred sites, how can I convince Eagle Flies and the others that they shouldn't fight back? Maybe that's part of the reason they're doing these things. Because they want you to fight. To be able to say, look, you see how these savages behave? Perhaps. Thank you for helping Captain Monroe to retrieve those vaccines, Arthur. He will be at the meeting and is one person who knows the true situation, at least. I still have hope that we can come to an agreement. This is where we finally get to meet Colonel Favors himself. <sighs> Colonel Favors, Captain Monroe, we come in peace. Hello again. Who are these two? They're uh, friends of my people. Hmm. Interesting looking fellows. Yeah, they won't cause any trouble. Well, I should hope not. <sighs> Listen, Mr... Uh... <coughs> Chief. Yes, uh, Mr... I can't say that silly name. Is it... In English, they call me Rain's Fall. Yes, yes, I'm... I'm, I'm sure they do. <sighs> Listen. We're all Americans here, and we want an outcome. But quite frankly, quite frankly, I am confused. Your men are little more than criminals, in my opinion. They keep breaking peace treaties we've made, causing disturbances in everybody's lives. But I pride myself on being a gentleman. Really, I do. But there are limits. The conversation is interrupted by one of Arthur's coughing episodes. However, we can see here that Colonel Favors is not a very respectful guy, referring to Rain's Fool's name as silly. A soldier named Jackson takes Arthur to a tent while he's coughing, as to not interrupt the conversation. However, whilst sat in this tent recovering from his episode, Arthur overhears an interesting conversation about the Colonel. No, no. You know he's going to have Monroe court-martialed or attempt to he's going to make a disgrace of him monroe he seems likable enough for a west pointer why you know what favors is like because he thinks it's right because he thinks monroe is a patsy or a spy he's convinced he had something to do with those vaccines getting stolen he thinks monroe is going to force him into making a concession with the indians so he removes monroe Removes how? Favors wants him tried for treason and hanged. Why does Favors care about the Indians? Because he doesn't want to back down. I mean, his whole professional life. You know what they say about him. High tail Favors. The man who missed a battle. Poor Monroe. Kind of liked him. I know. Well, still, he's kind of stuck up. According to his men, Favor's main position in this conflict is he does not want to back down. Known as Hightail Favors, the man who missed a battle, the Colonel is purely in this particular conflict for his ego. He wants a reputation that overshadows his previous humiliations, and when Leviticus Cornwall approached him with a proposition to drive the Wapiti off the reservation in order to drill for oil, Favors opted for underhanded tactics such as withholding vaccines from the reservation and confiscating the tribe's horses in order to aggravate them so, in the instance of open conflict, the Wapiti appear to be the aggressor and Favors can be the hero. It's also entirely possible that it was Favors or Cornwall who hired the poachers to kill the bison and leave their bodies to rot and make it look like the work of the Wapiti in order to either aggravate them or make them appear to be more savage to the public. And with every act of retaliation that Eagle Flies carries out, influenced by Dutch or not, this belief is vindicated. For the time being though, Favors appears to have it in for Captain Monroe. The lands you currently occupy belong to the United States government. Why is this so confusing, sir? Why? Good day, Colonel Favors. Well, that was remarkably unproductive. <clears throat> I'm afraid the federal government was quite clear, Colonel, that it wanted peace, and peace for all, and that the treaty had not been broken by anybody. Well, is that so, sir? And did it want impudence, sir, from a junior officer in public? Was that its plan too, sir? You insult me. 
You insult the regiment. Arrest this man. Arrest me? Gross insubordination. Disobeying an order. Treason. Are you mad? You had those vaccines stolen. You disrupted a negotiation. Let him go. This is all getting out of hand. Hi, right. Captain Monroe, let's get out of here. Hi, if I, I were you, I'd keep my mouth shut, amigo. Arthur and Charles rescue Monroe from this setup, and after a brief shootout with the US Army, they escape, putting Monroe on a train and sending him far away. With Monroe out of the picture, that's one less aide to assist the Wapiti. A sympathetic individual of high status within the US Army was a massive obstacle for Colonel Favors, and with him branded a traitor and not accounted for, Favors is one massive step closer to driving the Wapiti off their land. With Eagle Flies in US Army custody at Fort Wallace, any chance for peace between the Native Americans and the Army has gone out the window. In the next mission, the King's son, Arthur and Charles, head to Fort Wallace to break Eagle Flies out. Come in. <clears throat> Mr. Morgan, I'm so glad you could make it. How are you? My son. My son is foolish, but he's still my son. I know your son. A little. Uh, he's very brave. Very angry. <laughs> he's me. How is your father? He's dead a long time. He lived a lot longer than was good for any of us. My son probably wishes the same to me. <laughs> I doubt that. I want peace. I need my people to be safe. All my life I've tried to bring peace. But I love my son. They'll hang him for treason. Treason. He is the chief son of a proud nation. How could he commit treason? The people who have lied to my people for a hundred years or more, that's treason. Well, what should I do? I don't think there's much chance reasoning with Colonel Favor. No, and any chance we had, your friend, Mr. Vanderland, has ensured relations between us and the army are worse than any point in the last five years. I'm sure he means well. But matters are more complex than he understands. Me and Charles will try and rescue your son. No. Yes, yes. I ain't got much to lose, and you got... I'm doing this. Charles! Where are you? This conversation before Arthur and Charles head off to rescue Eagle Flies shows just how sticky the situation has become courtesy of Dutch's involvement. His influence saw Eagle Flies imprisoned after killing US Army soldiers, and the actions he's encouraged the young man to participate in has given Colonel Favors ammunition to use against the tribe. Charles hits this point home if you haven't already got the idea, but we have, so let's move on. Breaking anyone out of a military fort is no doubt going to cause more tension, however it's better than seeing Eagle Flies hang. Sent us. My father, he told you to come and kill guards? No, he didn't say that. He... Of course not. You okay? Sure. Enjoy being tortured. Clears the mind. If you say so. Whoa, whoa. No. I'm fine. I'm fine. Arthur and Charles escort Eagle Flies to the river where they have canoes waiting. They row down the rapids being chased by the army. Unfortunately, Eagle Flies is still insistent on fighting back. 
Not that it's making much of a difference at this point, the Wapiti are pretty much fucked. After the breakout, a newspaper article will read, Murderous Indian Breaks Free, Fort Wallace, A Bloodbath, Vicious Attack at Night, Colonel Promises Justice. In an act that further proves their treachery and villainy, restless and disruptive forces amongst the Indian population have once again attacked American forces, this time in an effort to free one of their own. A murderer known as Eagle Flies was broken out of an army barracks at Fort Wallace, where he was set to stand trial for a series of murders of army personnel. In a daring attack in the middle of the night, members of his disruptive tribe attacked soldiers, brutally killing them and fleeing with their comrade. Eagle Flies is the son of Rain's Fall, a chief of a disruptive tribe that makes up most of the population at the Wapiti Indian Reservation. The tribe has become unmanageable and more obstinate at every punishment handed down and treaty broken. Colonel Favors, who supervises Fort Wallace, has vowed swift and unrelenting measures to control the Indian problem in the region. This is war now, and it comes to a head in the main story mission, My Last Boy. Mr. Vandalin, Mr. Morgan, Charles, they try to kill my people for oil, for oil. Today we ride once more. Ride with me, ride with us. Ride with us against the factory. I love your courage, son. It is a thing of great beauty. Stop! Everyone, stop! My son, my last son, don't. When I was your age, I fought. I saw death. I have killed. The men I knew were slain. My firstborn, your brother, had his head smashed by a drunken soldier. My wife had her throat slit. I made peace. I knew not to trust. Yet I had no choice. Maybe you were right. Maybe the slow death is worse than the fast one. Maybe none of these men are good. Maybe a world in which they came to us is a world that we cannot endure. But endure we must. Father, you are tired. Do not die for pride, my son. We have suffered too much in this trick. The earth, the water, they have no pride. They endure, and we must endure. My only boy, my precious boy, do not mistake my strength for weakness. As your chief, I implore you. Your words mean nothing to me, father. Don't. Ride with me! Ah! Stop. Please. Stop. <laughs> Please, Mr. Morgan, after you helped me after we spoke, this is just a trap. My son, my people will all die. The wars are over. We have lost. These young men will be annihilated. Please. I'll see what I can do, Charles. Who else will come with me? No, oh, I'll ride, Arthur. Who knows what other secrets I'll learn about. Who else? I will. And me. Me too. Oh, and me. I guess. Eagle flies and his men ride out to attack the Cornwall kerosene and tar oil fields. The Vandalin gang closely behind. On the way, Dutch reveals he put them up to it. Why the hell would they attack the oil fields? What do you mean? It's perfect. This was your idea? Partly. The army. The government. The industrialists, they've taken everything from these people. Wouldn't you want to fight back? You've handed them a death sentence. <laughs> it's a massacre. We gotta help these men. Did anyone see Eagle Flash? There, going across the walkway. Got what you wanted, Dutch. You coming, Arthur? I'm gonna try and save him. This fight is unwinnable. If you go and distract them and let me get to him. Have it your way. The rest of you, ride with me. Let's meet up at the factory. Let's ride! Yeah! Go with them. Try and help there. I'm better off alone. We're riding with you. Come on, then. Yeah! 
Fighting by the factory. That's where Dutch is gone. Let's go, quick! Ugh. Any men we see, we must save them. After a quick shootout around the facility, Dutch reveals the reason why he wanted the Wapiti to attack this place was in order to acquire state bonds worth thousands of dollars. After acquiring these bonds on the way out, gentlemen, we're here for you. Your friend? Get in there, shoot him, find him now. Colonel Favors rocks up with a few more soldiers for us to shoot. Arthur gets sprayed by a burst pipe and attacked by three soldiers. Dutch leaves him to die, but... Gotta take the boy to his father. As you wish. Usually is nowadays. Sure. <clears throat> Come on! We gotta get back to camp and prepare. Let's ride! I'll be back when I can. I'll stay with you. And me, of course. And so will I. No, get out of here. Please. This ain't gonna be nothing nice. Be safe, Arthur. Alright, come on. Let's get him to what PT as fast as we can. Carrying a mortally wounded eagle flies, Arthur, Charles and Pater ride back to the Wapiti reservation. Eagle flies passes away, his hand held by his father, and his fight to save their land was in vain. This is the end of our journey with the Wapiti Native Americans, but we aren't quite at the end of the story, this is where it gets a bit more interesting. If we return to the Wapiti Reservation in 1907, the place is abandoned. No inhabitants, no oil mining operation, we can just find a solitary abandoned oil well. We can find a newspaper article titled Pump Jack Sits Silent that reads, No oil found at Wapiti, investors allege fraud. The oil reserves discovered on land near the Wapiti Indian Reservation in 1899 have turned up dry, and oil drilling operations have ceased and packed up. There were high hopes for the location following a detailed exploration by the Leyland Oil Development Company on behalf of Cornwall Kerosene and Tar, and a number of petroleum outfits had sought to develop it into a well-paying field. Workers flocked to the area in anticipation of jobs that would pay as much as 22 cents an hour. Companies sank well after well, coming up empty with only a minuscule amount of oil being found, not enough to keep operations running. The tribe at the reservation went on the run after a series of attacks on the army, culminating in a bloody battle at the Cornwall Kerosene and Tar Factory around the time news of the oil discovery became known. 
Many members of the tribe were gunned down in Wyoming, but a few members are believed to have escaped into Canada. It is unknown what will happen to the Indian reservation land moving forward, as there are no Indians in the area to relocate there currently. We learn that many members of the Wapiti tribe were gunned down in Wyoming, but some managed to relocate to Canada, including Rain's Fall, who we can actually find in the epilogue. Hello? Didn't I meet you a long time ago? I don't know. With uh, Arthur? Arthur Morgan? Oh, yes. My name is Rangeful. And I'm Jim Milton. John Marston. Oh. Is Arthur, uh... He passed away. A long time ago. Oh, I'm sorry. He saved my life. He gave his. That doesn't surprise me one bit. <laughs> and you? I know you had tough times. Ah, uh, well... My people aren't really a tribe. We're just a bunch of families, I suppose. But we're in Canada now. And it's, uh... What are you doing here? I... I don't really know. My son, I suppose. Oh, he fell. I, I know. I'm sorry. I've got a son. I'm very sorry. Oh, it was a long time ago now. Well, it's good to see you, uh, Mr. Marston. <laughs> and you? Uh, In the end of this situation, there were no winners. The Wapiti peoples lost their land, because it allegedly had oil. In fighting back the injustices his people faced, Eagle Flies gave his life. Leviticus Cornwall would die by the hand of Dutch Vanderlind for unrelated reasons well before he could even see the profits of this potential oil, and Colonel Favors died by the hand of Arthur Morgan during the battle at the Cornwall Kerosene and Tar Factory. Dutch Vanderlind, who thought he could use this entire situation as a smokescreen in order for his gang to escape, also lost here as his gang was disbanded shortly after after the events at the Cornwall Kerosene and Tar Factory concluded, and Rain's fall will be forever lost without his son, and his people have lost their land and their identities, now being more akin to a group of families than a people. Finally, the oil found at the Wapiti Reservation was negligible, and so all of this conflict and loss was for nothing. The only thing that came from this entire incident worthwhile was it gave Arthur Morgan a new perspective on his mentor, Dutch Vanderlind, realising that all those years his old friend was taking advantage of him the same way he took advantage of eagle flies. By the time Arthur realised this, it was too late, and it cost both him and eagle flies their lives. And it won't be the last time that Dutch uses the displacement of angry Native Americans as a means to an end for his own personal gain. But I think that brings us nicely to the end of today's video. Oh, crikey, it's a long one. But it's what you guys deserve, right? I hope it's been entertaining. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to go ahead, leave a like, subscribe, share the channel with your friends and all that wonderful stuff. That would be super fantastic. I've been working on a lot of content for this history channel and I can now happily announce that we will start releasing videos on that channel on the 19th of July. There'll be a link in the description as well as in a pinned comment, so definitely check that out if you like history. Me and my ragtag team of mates that I'm working on that with really can't wait to see what you guys have to say about it. Well, we're actually living in a perpetual state of dread, but enthusiasm never killed anybody, did it? And of course, with any luck, I'll be seeing you all very soon with another video at some point, but until next time, take care and goodbye.